Hi, uh, I'm a Mustafa. I'm a deep learning engineer at NERSC. Um, in this part of the tutorial, I'll cover some concepts in distributed training of deep learning models. After this, we will go to the demo where we show you how to scale a particular uh, model for a particular problem. So uh, in this talk, I'll, um, um, yeah, I'll cover some training parallelization strategies and, um, uh, and then I'll delve into more into large batch training um, and then I'll talk about the challenges with that and some, uh, some ways to, um, to avoid um, yeah, the problems with uh, large batch training. Mm -hmm. Um, so why do we first? Why do we need really to to um, parallelize uh, deep learning uh, training? So um, to the left shows you um, some uh, responses from our users on how long it takes them to train their deep learning models, and uh, as you can see, it takes hours, days, or weeks um, sometimes to train a, a model, and that is uh, definitely challenging when you are doing prototyping for for a new model to solve a new problem. Like for example, imagine that every time you need to compile your code, it takes days or weeks to compile uh, the code and then test it. Uh, that's definitely not um, um, uh, not efficient to actually uh, uh, solve any um, to to develop any um, uh, code or model, right? So we need to reduce this time to a reasonable. Um, uh, time span of like minutes, maybe hours is tolerable, um, days sometimes, but definitely uh, not to have the usual case being days or weeks. The other, the other challenge um, is that to train the models that we are training right now, which is these large deep learning models, you uh, typically need uh, larger and larger data sets, especially in science, the data sets are very large, they're in the hundreds of uh, of gigabytes or terabytes sometimes. So you need a way to process this data faster, right? You can just do it sequentially on a single GPU. Um, the other thing with deep learning is that to solve complex problems, you need um, um, bigger models. So the more complex the problem, the bigger the model that you would need to actually solve, uh, uh, solve it using deep learning. And uh, we have seen uh, an increase of the sizes, especially the depth of uh, of the of these model, the models that are deployed to solve, for example, vision tasks. Uh, the same thing for NLP tasks, and it's the same thing for all scientific uh, problems. To the right, you can see here, for example, um, the um, uh, versus year, how long it takes, or how, what's the computational needs for training uh, some of the major models now. Uh, on the market, this is compiled by OpenAI. You see, uh, you see, like the, the 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 increase in the curve is exponential and it's, it's very steep. So um, we need to to be able to to use um, uh, computational resources efficiently in parallel, so that we can reduce the the time that it takes to to train one of these uh, models to solve a real problem. So how do we do? Uh, par how do we actually uh, uh, parallelize training of a deep learning model? So there are different modes. The first one is uh, data parallelization, where imagine that you have a model that trains well on a single GPU, for example, or a single worker. It can be a CPU or a GPU. I'll, when I say GPU here, I also mean just a worker that could be a CPU too. So imagine that you have a single worker here, and it works well. It processes a batch in but you want to, um, to, to essentially finish the training much faster. Well, one thing you can do is you can replicate uh, the model itself among many workers, and then each one of those can get their own batch of a slice of the data set, and then they process the data set in parallel, right? And then this, this achieves scaling, and you can process the data faster. And this is what we call data parallelism, and that's what we'll be talking and focusing on today. But other modes of parallelism is for example, if uh, your model no longer, uh, if your model is large, uh, very large, that it no longer fits on a single um, uh, GPU, for example, or a single worker. In this case, you need to the distributed, distribute the model itself amongst multiple GPUs, for example, right? And there are several ways of doing that. One way, one, one way is to, um, to do layer-wise parallelism, where you take one layer and you split, let's say like this is the first layer that was here, like a big square, a big cube la layer, and you split that layer itself amongst multiple um, 
uh, wor workers. Yeah, the cube here is just the activations, but yeah, so essentially the, the layer is, is split uh, amongst multiple workers, and this way you can split, you know, parallel, you distribute the entire model uh, amongst multiple GPUs. You can do this the same for, for the other uh, layers as well. Another way of doing this, instead of splitting the layers or distributing the layers amongst multiple GPUs, you can do um, um, uh, pipeline parallelism, where essentially every layer is on a, same, on a particular uh, worker, or every few of them can be on, on a particular GPU or a particular worker, and this creates a pipeline that we call pa pipeline parallelism. Um, the most common uh, parallelism mode is data parallelism, uh, but uh, pi you know model parallelism in general, whether it's layer wise or pipelining, is becoming increasingly important as our models becoming lar are becoming larger and larger. So you will see more of those um, in practice. We are seeing more of those in practice, and we expect to see more of them um, in practice in the near future. So. I'll focus on data parallelism uh, for uh, today, and um, that's what you will see in the practical section. So now, how do you do data parallelism? As I mentioned, um, we split the data amongst multiple workers, right? We replicate the model itself and then split the data amongst multiple workers. But uh, what do you do? So in, in deep learning training, you, we train them using SGD, right? Like gradient um, uh, the descent and then back propagation. So there are two modes. There's uh, in, in of operation. There's the forward pass where you're going from the input all the way to the loss function, and then there's the backward pass where you're calculating the back prop operation, right? And you're calculating the gradients going back to update the weights. In the forward pass during data parallelism, you don't do anything differently from what you do. Uh, usually there is no communication whatsoever. You just take your model here. It's just schematically as a single matrix. You replicate it on the multiple workers, P01, uh, P012. And then you take the data itself and you split, you slice the data. And then each worker takes a slice of the data and produces its own output. And that's it, that finishes the forward pass. The backward pass is when you need to start doing communication. So the backward pass is you calculate the, the gradient of the loss with respect to the, to the weights. You do that locally. So each one of the workers does that on its own uh, GPU or CPU. Um, uh, and, uh, and then once the gradients are calculated locally, you need to do all reduce over those gradients before you update the local weights. Um, and that's, uh, that's the place where you, that's the, that's the only place actually where you do communication, um, during the, uh, data parallel training. Um, and this is, so this is, um, uh, uh this is how it works. There are pros and cons to this. Um, uh, some of the pros is that forward pass is completely local. Um, and um, the communication only happens during uh, the backward pass, uh, which means that, um, uh, and since you're doing it layer-wise uh, uh, back prop, you can also, there are a lot of opportunities to uh, overlap the, um, uh, the, all the communication with the computation operation. So for example, if you, you calculate the gradients for the last, uh, layer, and then you start calculating locally the gradients for the previous, the penultimate layer, and then while you're calculating the gradients for the penultimate layer, you could be doing the uh, all reduce over the gradients of the previous layer, right? So you overlap the communication with the computation. And this is very important, and this is essentially what enables us to scale um, data parallel training to a very large number uh, of GPUs. Now, some of the, uh, the cons of, uh, of this data parallel training is that essentially you need to um, increase the batch size, right? Like you can do strong scaling where you take one batch and then you split that batch amongst multiple workers and then, uh, and then your batch size, batch size doesn't change. And you can certainly do that, but that's, that has a diminishing returns, right? With the, you, uh, with the, um, um, uh, you can't increase the number of workers beyond a certain limit first, like maximum of just the local batch size of one. But there's also like, if uh, at a certain point the local computation becomes too little that the communication overwhelms or becomes the, the, uh, the largest 
um, um, uh, overhead, then uh, in that case, you're, you're essentially, you're not really reaping any benefits from doing parallelization. So you have to do weak scaling, right? Where you, you are increasing the batch size. I'll show uh, some schematics in a bit, in, in a bit. But essentially, if you're initially you have a you're running on a single worker with a batch size of 64, and you decide to do 10 workers, then your batch size becomes 640, um, and this is uh, weak scaling, um, and uh, this achieves a, a, you pass through the data much faster. However, there are challenges with training with large batch with large batches, and we'll talk about those in a bit. So um, another thing <laughs> to know about this is that um, I kind of implied that when we do all reduce, so we have, for example, if you have eight workers and you're doing all reduce um, amongst the eight workers, that this is a synchronous all reduce, which means that um, um, you need some, you need to wait for all the workers to finish their local calculations of the gradient. Um, to be able to actually um, to 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 be able to make an update, which uh, which means that when you go to a very large um, um, very large size um, um, uh, or clusters of like workers, then you might have more and more stragglers, um, and those could block the uh, the training. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this uh, large batch training. So. Just to recap, we're doing this. We have uh, we have a, a we're we are increasing the number of workers. So we and if we're doing weak scaling, then we are just each one of the workers gets its own fresh batch with the same size. So if we go to n workers, then the effective batch size becomes n times b. So um, and this is uh, this achieves, of course, like you process the data much faster, as we said. But you, uh, the, there are the, some challenges with how do you actually tune the SGD uh, parameters so to to account for this increase in the batch size. So let's remember how actually SGD works first. So uh, this the plain version of SGD. You have the you have your weights, um, uh, a certain parameter. You're trying to minimize the loss, uh, the loss, right? your data over or over your batch so what you do is you calculate the gradients of the loss um, over the entire batch and then you update the weights in a way where you are um, uh, you take one step in the direction op opposite right so you have a negative opposite to the gradient so the gradient points into the direction where it increases the loss you want to walk in the direction where it minimizes the loss and then you're averaging the, the, the gradients over the batch, and then you multiply it by a step size or uh, what we call the learning rate, right? So now if you decide to increase the batch size, what do you do to, to the learning rate? That's the question that we need to answer. So one way is to think about it is you say like, okay, so when I take three steps uh, with batch size B, if I increase the batch size by a factor of three, then maybe I should also increase the learning rate by a factor of three, right? So that's one way to do it, which is linear scaling. And the way that it would look in, um, um, uh, in equations is that, imagine that instead of taking, let's say like previously, if you wanna take two steps, so here's one step and here's the next step that starts from WT1, um, now you want to take it and you want to increase the batch size by a factor of two. You're comparing these two equations and you say, okay, so the, the B here, um, it was multiplied by two. I'm going to linearly scale the learning rate so that the total has the same scale, right? And that's linear scaling. Of course, one assumption here is that the gradient at, um, uh, at WT and the gradient at WT plus one are very close to each other that you can make this comparison and make um, uh, this reduction, right? Uh, but this is sometimes breaks as we will see in a little bit. But generally this is the intuition beyond uh, the uh, linear scaling. So essentially you scale the learning rate in such a way that you make this uh, factor here constant. Another way to, to think about scaling is to say like, look, the One, it's not important necessarily to keep this factor constant, but what is important is to scale, to keep the noise in the gradient uh, about the same. And 
Uh, and in this case, you'd see that if you look at the noise of the gradients or the covariance of uh, the, the gradient, uh, gradients um, uh, so you look at the covariance matrix, you'd see that the covariance matrix on the diagonal, for example, is a proportional to eta squared, which is the learning rate squared divided by B. And if you want to keep this, uh, the, the, uh, the gradient scales or like noise um, uh, scale to be constant, or approximately the same. So what you do is you need to scale the, the, uh, the learning rate by square root of n, right? When you go b equals to n, you need to, uh, to uh, just scale um, eta by n, and that way the, the square of this gives you n times eta, uh, eta, and then n cancels out, right? So that's another way uh, of doing it. Now, in practice, we actually see anywhere from sub square root uh, scaling of the learning rate to uh, linear scaling of the learning rate. Um, and um, you'll see like, for example, these are two works where uh, people apply, uh, uh, try, they scale uh, the ResNet training and you will see that in, in, in new as a sub, as a, like as a square root scaling while in Goyal, um, uh, two of the seminal papers, actually, these ones, and Goyal, they do linear scaling. We'll talk a little bit about this in, uh, in a second. And there is a study by um, OpenAI. It's actually now no longer recent, but uh, where they show only from an optimization perspective, not from like generalization uh, perspective, but only like from like a, the, the, the picture of trying to do m local optimization of what is the best what is the best learning rate to um, uh, and batch size um, as as we are increasing the batch size to achieve the, the uh, uh, to essentially to uh, to minimize the the loss function and they see that actually the scaling will depend on the batch size so the optimal learning rate depends on the batch size and when uh, your your batch size is small then um, the scaling, it might make sense to be more linear. But when the batch size is very large, then the scaling of the learning rate might be more uh, closer to a square root uh, sort of regime. So um, that's at least like some um, um, theoretical analysis that it has, comes with a lot of caveats, but it's, it motivates uh, these different scaling, uh, scalings of learning rate. So uh, coming back to, um, okay, so talking about some challenges with, with the scaling of learning. Let's say like we just scale, the, uh, um, yeah, we, we decide to, to train with the multiple workers, we have a much larger batch size. Some of the challenges are that if you, for example, let's say that you scale the learning rate linearly. Let's say that you are scaling, you're training with a single GPU and all of a sudden you wanna train with 100 GPUs. So, and you, if you multiply the learning rate by 100, then this assumption that essentially the gradient at WT is, is very close to the gradient at WT plus one breaks, right? Like you're, that's no longer the case, especially at the very beginning of the training, right? When the, when the, when the loss surface is still not very smooth, you, you're starting from random weights, the loss surface is not very smooth, and you, you decide to, um, uh, to, to scale the learning rate by a factor of 100, then um, you're taking these very large steps on a surface that is very unsmooth, right? And um, this, uh, uh, this is essentially like, it makes the training completely unstable and everything goes haywire. So one way to, to get around this is to, um, um, yeah, and then, in a second, I'll talk about how to, to get around this. But one way, uh, another issue with, uh, with training with a large batch size is that if you train, for example, this is an example of training with a batch size of 512, and then if you train with a batch size of 8,000 instead of 512, it seems that the models don't, um, um, don't generalize well. So you have something called the generalization gap. This is different from generalization gap that we usually talk about, which is the difference between loss and uh, um, the, like the training loss and the validation loss. This is generalization gap of training at different batch sizes, right? So it seems that training with a larger batch 
uh, doesn't achieve the same uh, generalization that you would get from a smaller batch size. And um, there are motivations for why that is the case. One of them is that um, um, essentially when you're training with, uh, with a larger, with a smaller batch size, um, so it's, it's uh, essentially like the, the minimizers or the minima that you find when you're training with a large batch size, it, they tend to be sharp minimas, like something like this. When you're, you're training with a smaller batch size, you, you tend to get these uh, flatter minimas. Flatter minimas are more stable to perturbations in the data, right? Like, so you can imagine here, if a small perturbation to the data gets you, like that makes the loss much higher, while here the, um, uh, small perturbations don't change their performance much. So the intuition behind this, again, this is not necessarily like the, the, the most um, rigorous um, uh, analysis of this, but the intuition behind it is that when you train with a smaller batch size, there is more noise in the gradient. And that noise kicks you out of these sharp minimums, which helps you go to an, a regime regions in the loss uh, surface where the minimums are more flat. But when you have these very large uh, batch sizes, then the gradients are much, much smaller. The noise in the gradients is much smaller, right? And that forces you to go and like just jump into the nearest uh, sharp minima. Um, and there is not enough noise to kick you out of um, these sharp minimas. So this is the intuition behind this. Um, people have done a lot of studies. You can see like, for example, in this paper by Jiwei um, uh, uh, Yao, um, you, you see like people showing, they, they show, for example, when you train with a batch size of 64 versus when you train with a batch size of 2000, all the way to 2000. And you can see that um, the, uh, some visualizations of the lost surface after training for a long time. And you can see that when you are training with a smaller batch size, you get to um, uh, parts of the loss function where it's very flat, while larger batch size, they get you to parts of the function that are there. They're, they have some curvature and they're sharp. So, in um, so how do you get around these issues? Uh, first, the instability in the beginning, and then this uh, this generalization gap. So, in in the one of the first works to actually uh, show that they can scale um, uh, the training of um, of ResNet to a very large uh, scale, or in this case, to a batch size of eight thousand. Um, First, they introduced the idea of learning rate uh, warm up, um, <clears throat> or they used, I'm not sure if they, are, they introduced that, but they used the learning rate warm up, where essentially instead of immediately starting with your target learning rate, let's say that you're scaling by a factor of 10, then linearly scaling the learning rate and starting by like whatever 10 times your original learning rate. If you start with that, we said that you would get that still this loss surface is, um, is not smooth and you get a lot of instabilities. So one way to get around it is that you warm up the learning rate over a few epochs first. And that's what they do. So they warm up the learning rate from um, the original learning rate all the way to their target learning rate over five epochs. And the other thing that they did is that they showed that linear uh, scaling seems to work for, um, uh, for this particular problem. And of course, the, the, also the paper goes through a few other uh, subtleties in, in, um, uh, that are common in the implementation of in, in like uh, distributed training. So after they fix this, they show that essentially they close that generalization gap between, for example, a batch size of 256 and a batch size of 8,000. And this seems to work for uh, different problems. It doesn't necessarily work for all scales. As you can see in the original paper, uh, it works up to batch size of 8,000, but if you want to go to batch size of, for example, 32,000 or larger, um, uh, you don't get necessarily, it doesn't, it still doesn't address the problems there. So there are still challenges with training with larger and larger batches. Another, uh, another idea is to, instead of doing, um, uh, increasing the learning rate, you can um, increase the batch size, the, gradually increasing the batch size itself. So the basic idea is that initially when you're training, uh, when you're in the beginning of the, of the training, you're still in this area where there are a lot of sharp minimums. And in that area, you use a smaller batch size. And then as you increase the training, you can start increasing 
um, uh, the batch size, and then uh, that should get and while fixing the learning rate, and that should get you to areas where you um, um, well, it gets you like similar performance to training on a single uh, batch size. Of course, this is this this idea is related to the idea of uh, learning rate decay, right? Like so, we usually decay the learning rate gradually as we are training. Um, here, the, the proposal is that instead of decaying the learning rate, you can increase the batch size. Um, in this work, they uh, take this uh, this idea and combine it with this uh, this the other intuition that or the empirical also uh, studies that show that the loss function is um, uh, less flat when your when your batch size is larger. So, which means that the the curvature of the loss surface could be a good indicator that okay now it's a good time to increase uh, the batch size while you're training and so they combine these two ideas and they um, introduce some measure of um, the loss surface curvature and they use that to adaptively so automatically increase the batch size as while they're training um, and they show that this works. So this is this is their other uh, work. They, they show that this works um, uh, really well. Um, and essentially, instead of trying like you pre-determine uh, the uh, the points where you increase the batch size, like these points, for example, you can uh, just let the um, uh, your your um, calculation of the loss surface curvature uh, uh, determine when it's a good point to increase the batch size. There are multiple innovations for how to, uh, 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 other ways of how to train um, to essentially handle this large batch um, uh, training problems. Um, the, here's one paper, here's another paper, and these are not actually, so this for example goes, trains a, a ResNet 50 in 74 seconds. Um, this is compared to, I think um, the, uh, this paper they started when they were doing with 256 it takes I, I if, I, if I remember correctly like 10 days and now we're talking about 74 seconds training for the same network and the same data set on the image name data set so um, I didn't uh, cover everything that um, 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 that could be said about large batch training um, what I covered is the basic concepts and uh, this basic concept related to like how do you, what, what are the challenges and uh, what do you need to do, uh, what do you need to think about. Most of the time you need to think about the learning rate scaling and how do you do that, how to avoid instabilities and all of that. There are other uh, innovations that people um, have, um, have come up with to, to doing uh, um, essentially large batch size training. One of them is uh, essentially like people have come up with several optimizers uh, to do that, like for example, LARS and LARC. Um, and I encourage you to look at those. Uh, the reason I'm not covering them because today we're not going to do the very large scale where you'd actually need things like LARS. We're just going to, to show you how to scale uh, the training from a single GPU to four or eight GPUs. But I mean, at this level of scales, you don't need um, um, necessarily need like LARS or, or, or LARC um, and also for the short of time, shortness of time. So um, before I, um, I close this talk, um, I want to mention uh, some works by um, uh, OpenAI and Google investigations in essentially um, uh, trying to understand what is the relationship between the batch size and the performance um, uh, or, or like the, the batch size and like the other parameters that there are there, like the learning rate and the gradient noise and all of that. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the details uh, now, but I, I just wanna uh, point out that uh, they essentially um, find that there is a relationship between the gradient noise and a critical batch size at which be going beyond that batch size, there is a, it's a point of diminishing returns. So you can't, you shouldn't be training larger than that. So, and uh, the other thing that they notice is that the more complex the problem, the more challenging and more complex the problem, the larger this intrinsic uh, property, which is the gradient noise that you would get from, uh, uh, from your data or the more complex also the data set itself, uh, the, the larger this gradient noise, and then the larger the effect, the critical batch size that you can actually use. So which 
the reason I'm mentioning this because this is an important idea, right? Like we are hoping that deep learning will be able to solve more, more and more complex problems, uh, right? And especially in science. Um, and so from these studies, we understand that uh, for those more complex problems, it is actually promising because we, we can use larger batch size to train those models and then, um, um, and, and that means like we can train them faster. Uh, so I, I see this as, as actually great news. Um, I encourage you to look at this paper and uh, at the paper and also at their uh, blog post here. So to uh, um, wrap up before we move to the demo, um, so we talked that we talked about distributed training. We talked about the different strategies of distributed training. Um, we focused on data parallelism. And then we talked about large batch training and how uh, um, it could be unstable and also doesn't generalize well. Uh, we talked about scaling to modest uh, regimes. Um, so essentially, like let's say like you're scaling by a factor of 10 from a single worker or single GPU to 10 GPUs. Um, you could be, you, the first thing I would try is to do learning uh, uh, rate warm up and uh, linear or sublinear learning rate uh, scaling. At least these are, this is the regime where you would want to, uh, what you would want to try. Um, this, this, for this, for these, for this scale of like for this, uh, for these scales or going, you know, Modest scales, uh, these, uh, these seem to work, but if you wanna go beyond that, then you probably wanna to look at Lars or Lark or uh, other optimizers that people have come up with for training with larger batch size. And this ends my talk. Um, now we'll move to the demo. Thanks.